All righty. Welcome, everybody. We have a fun program tonight with Roxy's Wicker. Roxy has been entertaining locals and visitors and curious souls with her unique ghost stories since 1994. Her company is the New England Curiosities and it's located in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So do check that out. It's a very cool site. She's been offering tours, spooky trolley rides, special haunting events. And she's always at the top of the nation's travel and tourism list featured on Psychic History, History Channel, Destination America, and the Travel Channel. Roxy has quite a following, not just in our area too. She's the author of seven locally best-selling books. We have some at the library, so do check them out. They are awesome. I've been reading them and getting scared for Halloween. <laughs> In addition to having her successful ghost tour company, she travels through the Northeast and gives talks and um, spooky engagements. She's also a consultant for haunted attractions and she's worked at places like the Mount Washington Hotel, Wentworth by the Sea, and the October Moon Halloween Museum in Salem, Mass. Join the meeting. Uh-oh. So, Roxy is well known and an expert in this field of ghostly hauntings and we at the Berwick Public Library in partnership with the Berwick Community TV are so happy to welcome you. Thank you Roxy for this really weird Zoom call, but at least we all get to be with you and hear your cool stories. So, please Roxy, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. I couldn't think of a more spooky evening to sit down and share some stories of legends and lore with you. Now, of course, we are here on the sea coast and we drive by old cemeteries and burial grounds all the time. But I always ask, do you stop to look and see what's there? Burial grounds can really tell us a lot about our communities, about our folklore, about our superstitions, and some of the gravestones themselves. Just the carvings are just so beautiful. And some people believe that gravestone carving is America's first form of folk art. So we're gonna take a look at a sampling. Now, certainly we could go on for hours and hours. So it's not meant to be a comprehensive tour of every single burial ground, but just a sampling, some stories that are known and some stories that are lesser known. My goal for all of you that are in attendance is to pique your interest and get you to go out and check out the burial ground that's in your backyard. And I do mean that in a very literal sense because just outside my window is a burial ground. It's about 10 feet away from me. And there's 13 people that are buried there. It dates back to the 1800s. And a lot of people used to be buried right on the property they used to live on. So we lose track of those burial grounds. Gravestones turn up in some of the most strange of places. And sometimes we don't even know the full story behind them. So as we go through tonight, as Sharon said, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type those into the chat. When I'm done, I'll go ahead and review any questions or comments that are in there. And then if you have a few um, live questions, I'd be happy to take those as well. Um, so of course we are in an electronic world. So please make sure that your volume is turned up. Um, if you are worried about your connection, you can always shut off your video screen. So um, if you're worried about people seeing you eat snacks or anything like that, um, you can just shut that off and that will help your connection as well. And please make sure that you're on full screen because full screen will really give you the depth of the presentation. So that way you can see all the details of the gravestones because you do want to get up nice and close to the ghosts, don't you? All right. So let me see um, through the magic of uh, the internet and uh, the airwaves. I'm going to click a share screen screen. And this is always the moment of truth when we cross our fingers and wave our magic wands to make sure that the share screen works. So please be patient if it takes an extra second. But I'm going to go in and see if I can um, make this happen. So let's see. Got it. Yay! Yay! Bravo. Excellent. 
So I was looking in a back door to try to figure this out because it's not on the screen. So there we go. So thanks for your patience, everyone. Um, that was, uh, you know, it's close to Halloween. I'm not really sure why the options are different, but we're going to move on from here. All right, so tonight's presentation is Story Stones and Superstitions of the Seacoast with me. And I am so excited to share some of these amazing stories from right here in our own backyard and maybe a couple from a little bit afar, but hopefully we'll tempt you to go and visit these places. All right, so I always stand in a burial ground and wonder what would it be like if there was someone standing next to every single gravestone? What would they want to say? What's their story? Where did they live? How do they impact our community? And while I do strive to tell the stories of the famous and the infamous, it's so hard to give a voice to everyone. There's a crumbling gravestone every day and we're losing our history all of the time. So when we look at these burial grounds, they really are museums of stone. I mean, there's just so much rich history that's there and um, definitely some ghost stories as well. So when we get into the ghost stories, all that I ask is that you have an open mind. You know, I know people have different varying beliefs about ghosts and spirits. Some people aren't going to believe it till they see it, but maybe the facts behind some of these stories will also be just as tempting as the ghosts. Ben Franklin said, show me your cemeteries and I will tell you what kind of people you have. I really think that goes along with the conditions of the burial grounds, certainly the stones that are there, where they're located. I think it really reflects on the community in many, many ways. So sometimes people will, will ask some of the basic questions. So, you know, if Portsmouth was founded in 1623, they were out on the Isles of Shoals in the late 1500s mapping the Isles. They were settling Kittery and York in the 1630s. Where is everybody? You know, because when we look at our oldest gravestones, we're looking at the late 1600s, early 1700s. So the earliest grave markers here in New England were simply just stones and boulders that were designed to keep the dead from rising up out of their graves. There was, you know, no quarries, there were no gravestone carvers that were here. And there were a lot of reasons why they simply just wanted to use these boulders. Sometimes they didn't want people to know how many folks had died in a community because when they had come over, the settlers had come over to the new world, of course, they weren't the only ones that were here. There were many Native Americans that were here. There were a lot of clashes with the Native Americans. Portsmouth alone had 11 Indian raids in the 1690s. Of course, we have over in York in 1691, we had the York raid. So a lot of those original burials, if they had any sort of marker, <clears throat> they would have been either made out of stone or out of wooden planks. And all these years later, a lot of those have fallen by the wayside or simply gotten lost. So if you've ever watched the news and noticed that sometimes when they're digging an on-ramp or someone's you know, digging in their backyard, that there is sometimes a discovery to be made. And this is still happening. And when we get to some of these stories, you might be surprised to see how often this actually happens. So this is why we don't often see these old gravestones because this is all they look like. My clue for you is when you're out and about is to look for um, old stone walls if you can and notice if there's any rough stones within those walls. And you'll find these again all over New England, even places like Patuckaway State Park have these little strange old burial grounds that don't have gravestones as we know it. So we're gonna talk about different terminologies and designs of the gravestone. So I just wanted to share that with you here so you'll know what I'll be making reference to. And then of course, those will all go along part and parcel um, with some of our ghost stories and superstitions as well. So when we look at our traditional New England gravestone, you know, basically from colonial days, right up through early Victorian times, you'll have a lunette, which is the curved half moon shape on the gravestone. You'll have the finials or the shoulders, the inscription, um, the tablet or the epitaph and the borders of the stone. 
So you might hear me use those words interchangeably as we look at some of these stones. So we're gonna start with one of the oldest burial grounds that I first became aware of, and it's actually over in Portsmouth. It's called the Point of Graves. Officially, the date at the Point of Graves is 1682, um, although we know that there were burials that took place as early as 1671 and maybe even earlier. If you're wondering where this burial ground is, it's actually right next to Prescott Park. So as you're going past Strawberry Bank and you take a left onto Mechanic Street and go towards the Pierce Island Bridge, this is that small little burial ground that is on the right-hand side. It's really um, not more than an acre big, but it is so filled with history and artwork and ghosts, of course. Now, the Point of Graves is really a very odd name for this old burial ground, and we have to go back into the history of the Portsmouth waterfront. In the 17th century, it was essentially a point of land surrounded by water. There was no bridge to Pierce Island. There was no Prescott Park. Those were all deep water wharves. And the land that it's on was actually called Pickering's Neck. So here you have a street that was originally called Graves End Street because the street ended at the burial ground. So hence the name, the point of graves, a point of land to be used for burial purposes. In this um, antique photo here, you can see that there's actually wharf houses all around the point of graves. So we'd be standing looking towards Pierce Island in the center of the burial ground right here. A lot of the gravestones at the point of graves are from the 1600s, which really makes it um, so rare and unique because we don't have a lot of those to find anymore for a number of reasons. If you go to towns like Exeter, New Hampshire, you'll find that they did have burial grounds, of course, with gravestones in the late 1600s and early 1700s. However, in the 19th century, they made the conscious decision to till under their old burial grounds and build on top of them. So now really all you'll find in Exeter um, is just a handful of graves from the 1700s. So it's really nice to see that somehow this graveyard has survived all these years. So here's a, a nice view of some of the stones that are there. So today you'll find that there are about 125 gravestones that remain at the point of graves. However, this burial ground is actually full to capacity, much like a lot of our small burial grounds. The reason why they stop burying people there is due to overcrowding. So what does that mean? It means that they were digging fresh graves, unearthing older burials. So essentially, wherever you are standing, you are standing on top of someone. I always tell people when we go into the point of graves just to walk with, um, you know, care and respect. Uh, generally speaking, you know, whatever ghosts are in here don't want to follow you home. And the ground even today is shifting a bit at the point of graves. There's lots of sections where you can see the coffins have collapsed over the years. So there's um, some softer areas, which I always recommend not walking on. Um, but it's interesting to note that in 1908, a survey was done of the point of graves, which you can find at the Portsmouth Athenaeum. And at that time, it chronicled that there were over 200 gravestones that were here. Now, what happened to all of those stones between 1908 and, of course, current times? Well, of course, you have, you know, wind, weather, you know, gopher holes, um, all of those shifting grounds that you're looking at right here um, sometimes will claim a gravestone or two. However, I was very surprised and quite shocked to find that in the Boston Globe in the 1980s, they had chronicled um, the Point of Graves and also the North Cemetery, which is the city's second oldest, and come to find out people who were doing genealogy, finding that they had ancestors on the seacoast, weren't content in just going to the burial grounds to take pictures. Some gravestones had been removed and taken by descendants of people that were buried. So um, the article also tells us that around that time, which I was alive in the 1980s, um, I, and I don't remember this being a thing, but maybe um, some of you might remember that there was a trend for gravestone coffee tables. And um, personally, you know, I, I can't even imagine, you know, the, attempting to make a piece of furniture out of a gravestone. But the story goes on to tell us that some of the largest gravestones would command up to $2,000. 
So, um, you know, again, I wouldn't want that juju on my head. You know, gravestones are best left where they are. Um, they're pieces of history and it's illegal to remove a gravestone um, from any cemetery. However, there were some issues in the 80s. That's why we're left with so few gravestones. But still, it's amazing to see that there are many that are in there. Now, of course, as we go around, you can see <laughs> beautiful homes in the background that date back to the 1700s. Those two that you see, um, the red and the black one there from the early 1700s are um, just beautiful and they back right up to the burial ground. So this is the oldest gravestone in the state of New Hampshire. It's for Anne Jaffrey and she died in 1682 on December 6th. She has a death's head on the lunette on the curved part of the gravestone there with the crossed bones. So a death's head is sometimes referred to as a wing skull or a soul effigy. And some people will often ask about this very grim type of design on the stone itself. And it really was just a reflection on the communities back in colonial days. And the images really aren't so much for the people that are buried there. They're actually more for the living. So if we consider colonial New England, there was no modern medicine, no vaccinations. Many women died in childbirth. You had a high infant and child mortality rate. You had ships that brought in disease from all around the world. Throw in on top of that, the hellfire and brimstone preachings of the ministers back in the day. Um, children were shown corpses. They were told their parents would testify against them at the last judgment. So as you're to walk by these gravestones, the message is to contemplate your own existence on earth. Were you being a good person? Were you following the teachings of the church? That this could be you that's buried here. Now, there's a couple of things at work on this gravestone that might be easily overlooked. So when we read the inscription on the stone, it tells us, you know, Anne Jaffrey, ye wife of George Jaffrey, and she died at the age of 18. So right away, we know that she was married and, you know, she was 18 years old. And when we look at the borders of the stone, you'll notice that those are figs and figs were carved on gravestones to denote that this was somebody who lived a full and abundant life. Isn't that kind of hard to imagine that at the age of 18, that was a full and abundant life? But, you know, your life expectancy in 17th century New England was probably somewhere around the age of 25. So it's um, it's really just amazing to to see, um, you know, the sentiment that is carved on the gravestone. You'll also notice something um, a little bit more subtle about the stone is it almost has a lavender or purple kind of color to it. This stone has taken an incredible journey. Anytime you're in a colonial burial ground and you see a gravestone that has um, kind of a purplish undertone to it. Those gravestones usually are from the 17th century and they came from England. A lot of our gravestones here on the sea coast and all throughout New England as well came over as ballasts on ships, um, typically shipped down to Boston in most cases and then making their way up to the sea coast. So we know that this gravestone came up from Boston, but it originated over in England. And the reason for that is, much like I was explaining earlier, you know, we didn't have uh, quarries, which we'll take a look at a little bit later. Um, we didn't have uh, ways for people to carve gravestones. So they had to make this incredible journey. But again, this is um, Anne, Anne Jaffrey, who is living to the ripe old age of 18 in 1682. Other gravestones um, at the point of graves are also quite interesting. When we look at the death's head on this stone and we see the way the wings come up, they form a heart over the skull. So the soul or the spirit is being lifted up and made victorious over death. Again, it's really subtle and we have to consider, you know, the time frame. People didn't hang, you know, artworks in their homes. There wasn't a lot of imagery. Certainly there was no photography, very little painting. So these images really were um, just so important to people in the community and really understanding all that they have to tell us. So this stone, as we can see here for James Levitt, is from 1718. I've been um, to more cemeteries than, uh, than I can count um, over, you know, probably the past 30 to 40 years. And there's sometimes a few gravestones that really, really stand out. And um, this is one of them. We're still at the point of graves in Portsmouth. And you can see this is for John Moulton. 
And um, he was just seven years old when he died, October the 7th, 1719. You can see there's even a little correction of spelling on the stone. If you look at the word molten, his last name, you can see the um, stone carver squeezed in the O. But if we look at the borders of the stone, this is something that is extremely rare and you just do not see um, anywhere in New England that you have these beautiful vines of raspberries on the borders of the stone to show you that this was a child who was just ripening on the vine, who had been plucked from the vine of life. So you have these stones that are just telling us these incredible stories through the artwork. And again, consider what you're looking at was all carved you know, with a, a hammer and chisel. There was no machinery at the time. So you had a very skilled stone carver carving all of those details that you see right there. So this is one of um, my favorite gravestones and you might actually recognize the design on the lunette of this stone. Um, it's actually the logo for New England Curiosities. And um, this is just such a, an incredible story. Um, and sometimes people will come out um, to talks or on tours and ask, you know, the obvious question, you know, oh, have you, you know, ever experienced anything? Do you see anything in these cemeteries? And it's not always the way that you picture it happening. So this is the grave for Elizabeth Pierce. Um, she died January 13th, 1717 in the 42nd year of her age. She has this beautiful death's head on the lunette there, um, really well carved. And if you notice perched on top of the skull, is an hourglass and that's to remind you of the delicate balance between life and death. If you were to look even closer you would see that all of the sands are carved out at the bottom to show you that time has run out for Elizabeth. Uh, leaves and flowers all along the borders of the stone to reflect the cycle of life. So birth, life, death and the leaves and flowers for renewal. So it was a beautiful August day. I was just wandering um, through the burial ground, taking pictures as I often do. And as I walked away from Elizabeth Stone, I started to walk across the burial ground. And I was intent on seeing another stone. However, as I walked, um, quite clearly, I felt a hand on my shoulder. It wasn't as if someone had bumped into me. It was as if someone had, you know, reached out to my shoulder and said like, hey, come here. So I turned around and there was nobody there. And again, if you don't believe in ghosts, just humor me for a minute. Um, and I didn't see anyone that would have been anywhere close to me. The tree branches were too tall. I was too short. So my husband was all the way across the burial ground near the gate. So I yelled over to him and I said, honey, I think something just touched me. And of course he looked down and uh, said, there's nobody there, but you. So, um, that afternoon, uh, it seemed to be a little bit out of character for myself, but I did immediately leave the graveyard and go across the street onto the sidewalk and contemplate what just happened. I mean, it was pretty clear in my mind that I had felt somebody. So I'm trying to make a long story short. Um, I noticed that as we were going to the burial ground, um, I actually do tours of the point of graves. I was really surprised how often people would single out Elizabeth's grave to go and take a look at. So I decided to do some research on her story and it's really um, quite an incredible story. So uh, Elizabeth Pierce, when she died again, the age of 42 in 1717, she had nine children. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't even imagine, you know, having that many children. And when she passed away, she died from consumption. So consumption is like uh, tuberculosis. It's sometimes referred to as, the wasting away disease, it's a very slow, painful way to die. And she lived in a part of Portsmouth that is known as Greenland, New Hampshire. Portsmouth used to be sprawling. It was Newcastle in Greenland. And after Elizabeth's death, um, the Pierce Family Cemetery was actually established across town in Portsmouth's Little Harbor section. So if you drive to that part of town, you'll notice that there's a 1960s neighborhood with um, all the houses backing up to an 18th century cemetery. So it's kind of strange, um, but you know, that's sometimes how things go. And um, I started just to notice that everybody had something to say or people will leave things at Elizabeth's grave. I was walking through Portsmouth one day and a gentleman approached me and you know, I had never seen him before. And he said, you know, I know the story about Elizabeth. It's like really strange how it happens. And um, 
he told me that he kayaks off of Pierce Island and every time he drives by the barrel ground, he'll say hi to Elizabeth. And then when he leaves, he says goodbye. And one day it started to rain. He was in a rush to leave through the kayak on the car and whizzed by, but didn't say goodbye. And he said the volume on his radio turned itself all the way up. So he went around the block, slowed down behind Elizabeth's grave and said goodbye. And he said, everything was fine. He said, so I always say goodbye to her when I leave. Um, it's just, uh, just, it still is a very active space for me when I go there. Um, and it's just such a, an incredible moment. I'm not afraid anymore. I just kind of feel like she's there from the past reaching out to the present. So we're taking a look here at this beautiful gravestone. So this is um, early 1800s, so 1802, we're up in Bath, Maine. And um, this is a child's gravestone. So aged three years, three months. And you can see the beautiful design on the stone of the setting sun. So telling us that the sun has set on his days. And um, it's just, it's so heartbreaking to look at gravestones for children. Again, we have to consider, you know, if there was a sickness or something going through the community, um, that would often be the, the people that it would affect um, the hardest. And that's another reason why people had such big families back in the day as well. But I thought this gravestone was absolutely beautiful, just looking at the, the setting sun with the little eyes peeking out. So we're going to pop over to Kittery. And um, I, I will warn you in advance, um, we are going to take a look inside one of the tombs um, in Kittery and it's the Pepperell tomb. So uh, if you are a tad bit squeamish, it's nothing gory or anything, but it is, you know, a look inside a tomb, which we'll look in just a minute. I'll, I'll warn you again. Um, but this is a beautiful Pepperell Mansion, which of course you can still find in Kittery Point. It's one of my favorite houses from the 1600s in Kittery. Um, Sir William Pepperell was granted a lot of land that eventually became really Kittery as we know it. Um, there was a training field, lots and um, lots of history related to the Pepperell family. However, um, a lot of people don't know that he and his family are actually um, buried across the street. Now, you may know this, but I'm always surprised by people when I talk to them about the tomb. People are like, I had no idea that it's there. So he's buried in this tomb across the street, really at the edge of a parking lot. So this is what the tomb looks like. This is a historic postcard of it. And um, sometimes when we think about tombs, we really try to, to understand, you know, well, how, how did these tombs work? Um, the Point of Graves has uh, several tombs and one of those um, was accidentally opened in the late 1800s when the stone was being reset and there was a description of what they had found inside. This stone here in 1970 was being reset because the, the ground was kind of coming out from underneath it. And when they opened it up, it really confirmed um, about some of the strange things that you'll find in these old tombs. So, you know, we picture when someone passes away that they are placed in a coffin, the coffin is placed in the ground, and we kind of have an idea of what it was like. Well, sometimes when these tombs were used, they didn't bother to use coffins. Um, they would wrap people in a shroud and put them in the ground. And the reason for that was because it would take up a lot less space. You could fit more people um, in these underground tombs. So it's very surprising when we look inside this tomb to see really how much they were maximizing space. So there's gonna be two pictures that are um, from uh, the Athenaeum in Portsmouth that are gonna show you what it looks like inside. You know, it's nothing horrifying, but it might be a little surprising. So this is the shelf inside the pepperel tomb. And if you look really closely, you'll notice that um, we just have a series of heads in there. And it is believed that that was all that was retained from the pepperel family. You can see some of the rotting boards that are there. And again, to make sure that there was enough space for everybody um, without having to, you know, get into all of the gory details. But here, you can see um, this gentleman again back in 1970 inspecting the tomb and he's got gloves on and he's actually taking down 
um, one of the skulls to give it a closer look. So these tombs are all over the seacoast. They're everywhere. Some of them have been covered up with dirt. Um, some of them you can still see the door or a partial door. So know that these are really large rooms. Um, again, in the point of graves, the one that you can see in there, which is next to the Vaughn tomb, you really can only see a corner post, which is kind of sticking out that looks like a gravestone, and a lot of brickwork in between the grass. So they're usually rooms like this big enough to walk into. So here you can see he's just um, taking a look at uh, the remains of who's left in there. So it's always quite curious to think that there's a lot more than, um, than meets the eye um, underfoot sometimes. And sometimes you'll see a name on a tomb and not realize that there's actually a whole bunch of people that are in there. Um, and that's kind of the case with the Vaughn tomb in Portsmouth. It lists, I think there's um, three or four names on it. However, they found 28 skeletons on shelves. And here, as we can see, there's certainly more than um, just Sir William Pepperell and his wife. There's quite a, a number of people that are in here. So I found this to be um, absolutely fascinating because you'd never know it um, from the outside. Here's a look at a later idea of that. So this is up in Portland, Maine. And this is um, an underground tomb from 1870. And if you were to peer um, between the space and the doors, which I did with a flashlight, you can actually see that there is a set of stairs that goes down and a marble floor in here. And um, you can see how everybody was buried under underground here. So it's, um, it's interesting, it's, you know, it's closed now, obviously they're not using it anymore, but there's so much more to burial grounds that some of them have this massive underground that we don't even realize. And I remember a few years ago reading an article about Copsail Burying Ground in Boston, how people were touring the burial ground and they stood on one of the slabs, um, which actually was the top of one of these underground tombs. And it was so old that the weight of them standing on top of it, it actually gave way and they fell down into the chamber. Luckily here um, at the Evergreen Cemetery, there are metal doors and they're very easily seen, um, but just um, absolutely amazing to think of the whole other side, um, or dare I say the whole underside of these burial grounds. So we'll take a quick look at um, the Eastern Cemetery up in Portland, Maine. Um, it's, it's such a strange story, particularly um, when it comes to the ghost stories as well. So the Eastern Cemetery is quite old. It goes back to, um, you know, the mid 1600s. It's where a lot of the founders of Portland were buried. And the cemetery was um, used for so many years going from the back to the front, which sometimes when you go into a burial ground, you'll notice that most of, you know, the original burials are all very close together. And then you can kind of chart and see how it spreads out through the grounds. So unfortunately, um, the Eastern Cemetery has had some issues over the years. After the 19th century Great Fires in Portland, which was um, just devastating to the city, um, unfortunately, not a lot could be saved of the old wooden homes. That's why Portland is largely Victorian today. But to rebuild Portland into the Victorian era city that we see today, um, one very surprising thing happened to the cemetery. The decision was made to dig out the back third of the burial ground and use it for fill. And the reason for that was they could rebuild the city of Portland. So today you'll see that there's a retaining wall along the back of the cemetery. And um, it's also important to note that between the years of 1989 and 1993, two men with baseball bats went into the burial ground and destroyed um, over a thousand gravestones dating from the 16 and 1700s. So today there's a friends group that is preserving the burial ground for future use, trying to restore the gravestones. Here on the left, you can see a picture from around um, 1900 or so. And on the right, you have a picture that's probably about 15 years ago. And some of the stones have been fixed. They're working very, very hard to get the cemetery back up to snuff. But there are um, a lot of ghost stories that are here. So here, when we look at this old postcard, 
which again shows that same area um, going back well over 100 years. There are some ghost stories about these two commanders who are arguing. Um, one, of course, a British commander, one um, a, an American or revolutionary commander, um, both of the Enterprise and the Boxer, who had a fierce naval battle um, just off of Casco Bay. And oddly enough, they were buried side by side. And one of the ghost stories is that you can actually hear the men arguing with one another, even though they've been long in the grave for well over a hundred years. So there's lots of stories of hearing voices coming out of the burial ground. For a number of years, very early on, when I first discovered the burial ground, they actually had um, closed uh, pretty much all day long um, and you couldn't get in, the gates were locked and the place you had to go to get the keys was uh, across the street in um, the little bar if you wanted to visit the cemetery. But today, like I said, they've done um, a really, really nice job. And here is um, a very interesting uh, piece of ephemera right here. This is a statement of expenses for the burial of British Captain Samuel Blythe of the Boxer again, um, in, engaged with the American ship, the Enterprise. And it chronicles, um, you know, how much everything costs. So digging the grave was $1.50, uh, tolling the bells was a dollar. It wasn't just free. Um, the hire of a horse for the hearse was a dollar. Um, so it gives you all of uh, the details that were there. And of course, um, they were both killed in the battle and now they reside side by side. But according to some, they're still yelling about the battle. So we're going to go over um, to the old York burying ground. Um, this is another one of those curious cemeteries where there's, you know, much more than meets the eye. So the old York burying ground is located in York Village. Officially, the date is about 1702, 1705. But we know that York was settled in the 1630s. So if this is the oldest burying ground today in York, is that bringing us the thought of where is everybody else? So unfortunately, um, I found out a very surprising thing about York through uh, the museums of old York when I was researching um, my book on at York County. I was surprised to hear that in the 1950s, the original settlers burying ground, which was a little bit closer to York Beach, because the original settlement was actually along the York River. So somewhere up in that neighborhood, uh, someone had decided to sell off the property around it. And the original graveyard, stones, bones and all, was tilled under and built on top of. And I spoke to a woman from the Historical Society again over there who told me she remembers back in the 50s, seeing the bones being tilled under and nothing was done about it. So that leaves, of course, the old York burying ground as the oldest burying ground um, in town today. However, here's a strange footnote for that. Just across from the burying ground is um, Yorktown Hall. And you'll find another cemetery back there, um, which is largely more Victorian and is still being used um, in some sections. So it was just a couple of years ago, and you can go back to the Portsmouth Herald and find this article. Um, they were doing some uh, site survey work and they commissioned something called GPR, which is ground penetrating radar. They scanned the ground and found that behind town hall was an unmarked burial ground, which nobody knew about again until about two years ago. So in between this burial ground and the one across the street, they found 99 people and they believed it to be a pauper's burial ground which I was completely amazed that there was no record of this, that somewhere it had gotten lost along the way. And then upon further and deeper investigation, they found this burial ground, which has um, no markers, no nothing, no stones. Um, and it's right in between, essentially, again, right behind Town Hall. So this is a, um, a pretty amazing burial ground for a lot of reasons. You can see the trees in there are really um, just beautiful. And a lot of them have these little discs on them with numbers and the trees are all kept track of. And it was a few years ago, a uh, microburst during a thunderstorm had blew its way through the town of York. And when it did, it actually took out some of these trees. So notice this older picture of mine here with all of these tall trees 
Now notice how they're all gone here today. So these trees, when they came down, you can see how tall they are. Amazingly, not a single one took out a gravestone, which is pretty amazing in its own right. However, um, the trees themselves are quite curious. So these are sassafras trees. And when the explorers came to the new world and they were looking for the elixir to life, they were looking for sassafras. And um, they would make healing bombs, tinctures and ointments out of them. So these are some of the tallest sassafras trees in um, Northern New England. And I always hate to say it this way, but um, you know, what do you think is fertilizing these trees, but it's all of the decay and decomposition in the burial ground. So while a lot of the trees did come down, there is still a handful of them that are there. And I'm still just amazed because I was there that day when they came down and not a single gravestone was damaged. But let's take a look at one of the reasons why a lot of people like to go to this burial ground. And there's a lot of history, myth, and um, misconception about this grave, although it's been written about as the witch's grave since somewhere in um, the early 1800s, um, around 1840 or so. So this is the grave for Mary Nason, and she was 29 when she died in 1774. She has a beautiful gravestone that was carved in Boston by the Lampson family of stone carvers. You can see um, how the figure has a very large piercing eyes, um, the shroud around the shoulders and, and the tiny hands. The stone goes on to tell, tell us that she was a loving wife and a tender parent dear, and that upon his death, her husband hoped his dust would mingle with hers. And then it goes on to say sacred to the memory of Mary Nason. When we take a look at the grave itself though, it brings up the whole legend of the witch's stone. So this, I really, um, I, you know, I love the idea of the legend, but we really have to look at the truth of the matter, which I personally think is a little bit creepier than the legend. So um, allegedly Mary Nason was the witch of Old York Village. And again, I think there's a lot of misconception here. Um, you know, she was an herbalist for those who were seeking healing cures and going to the local doctor. It just seemed as though you know, Mary Nason knew exactly what people had needed. And that wasn't uncommon. People kept herbal closets, you know, all throughout New England. Some people were just really very good at it. So for whatever reason, um, the story sprung up around the stone that was placed over her grave. And it was said to become known as the witch's stone to keep her from rising up out of the grave. And one of the other legends is that if you were to touch the upright stone versus the stone on the ground that you would find the upright stone would be cooler and the one on the ground warmer because you could actually feel her powers emanating from the grave. I'm gonna get really just honest with you here. Um, first of all, if we take a look at where the sun is, um, in this photograph, you can see the sun warming the stone on the ground. So naturally it's going to be a little bit warmer. And there is a hand-drawn map of the burial ground that shows us that there was a line drawn behind every headstone to denote that everybody had these long stones. So why are they there and where did they all go and why is Mary Nason's stone still there? Well, not, um, not surprisingly in uh, Colonial New England, sometimes um, you know it depended on how much the grave diggers were paid, how much energy they had for the night, and um, the conditions that they dug into. So not everybody was buried six feet under. And there are some accounts of people leaving Sabbath services at the church across the street from the burial ground and noting that the pigs were in the cemetery rooting up all of the fresh burials. So I think that's you know far scarier than a woman who is being accused of a witch. So these stones were placed over the graves and they're actually called wolf stones designed to keep the animals from digging everybody up. However, if we take a look back, we'll notice that Mary Nason is the only one that has that stone over her grave. But if we take a look at the wall, so if we look at the wall in the foreground, you're going to notice that it's made up of two layers you have the kind of cobblestone layer on the bottom, and then you have this layer of long stones on the top. 
It is thought that all of the wolf stones were removed and placed on top of the stone wall to raise it up to also keep the animals out. However, the only long stone that remains is on Mary Nason's grave here. And you'll notice in this historic photograph on the right, she actually used to have a footstone at one time. Um, unfortunately, that was uh, broken during some cemetery maintenance a few years back. So hers remains. Would you want to be the one removing the stone on the alleged witch's grave? Probably not. And that's often why I wonder that she still has it on her grave. Now, of course, um, if you wanted to take a deeper dive into some of, you know, the paranormal accounts in here, and again, um, you know, everybody seems to have a different commentary on that. Um, some people believe that there's a, a ghost at her grave site. Um, I'm not sure. I've never experienced anything while I was there, but some paranormal groups have said they've gotten EVP, electronic voice phenomena, hearing um, someone talking at the grave. Um, there is a lot of sound that echoes through York Village. Um, we've been there and heard owls calling, uh, you know, across the burial ground one to another. Um, there's also stories of shadow people in the burying ground, um, the shadows of figures moving between the gravestones, um, as if, you know, there were people that were walking around at night. However, if we do look at the gravestones, you'll see the shadows that they cast um, almost look very human-like because of the shape of the gravestone. So, you know, on a moonlit night with wind in the trees and the leaves blowing around, maybe it could look like somebody walking through there, or maybe it's just the shadows of the gravestones. I'll leave it for you to decide. But one final note on Mary Nason before we move on. There was um, a book that was written. It was called um, uh, Ancient Town of Georgiana, a uh, modern uh, city of York. And it really gave us a, an interesting insight on why Mary Nason isn't a witch, but it also leaves a lot of questions. It tells us that if a woman was a witch in the town of York, that the method for dealing with witchcraft was to take the dead body down to the seaside, let three tides wash over the dead body, and then the body would be buried at a crossroads. So if indeed Mary Nason was a witch, she never would have been buried in the burial ground. Um, I just thought that was really interesting. I haven't been able to find that they actually did that to anyone. Rather, that was the method for dealing with anybody that um, had been thought to be a witch in York. So apparently they had it all figured out. Now, um, one more footnote for you about York. If you're ever wondering um, where they conducted hangings in the town of York, it's actually right down where the Stage Neck Inn is. Have you ever thought about that weird name, Stage Neck? That's where they used to do their hangings in York. So I find York um, absolutely fascinating certainly when it comes to their burial grounds and their folklore that's over there. Here's one of the other um, amazing stones that I wanted to share with you from the burial ground in York. You can see this is uh, for uh, Mrs. Ruth Lyman and this stone actually came up from Connecticut. They were from Lyman, Connecticut and had this beautiful red sandstone shipped up. The uh, image on the right is from the Farber Gravestone Collection and this photo was taken um, about 60 years ago. You can see how much better condition it was in. You can see the angel uh, rising through the arches of heaven. We know it's heaven because there are stars that are there. And the whole manner of this stone still looking at least halfway decent as it does, I think has a lot to do with the tree that's over it. Because if you go down to Connecticut and see these red sandstone grave markers, you'll see that most of them have fallen apart and they're completely illegible because it's just such a soft stone. But what an unusual find to see a gravestone from Connecticut in the town of York, Maine. So we're going to take a little uh, field trip up the coast of Maine um, for this very interesting story that um, I think has kind of been lost to the archives. And this beautiful uh, cemetery is located in Harpswell, Maine. Harpswell is a beautiful um, peninsula and they still uh, do a lot of fishing and lobstering and it's almost like traveling back in time there. 
This is the cemetery that is behind the meeting house. There's a lot of um, really fantastic gravestones. I love all the fingers pointing skyward, letting us know where everybody has gone off to. Here we have this beautiful stone um, with these flowers and one broken bud just barely opened um, for a child and broken flowers have been opened again signify a life cut short so this stone here is um, from 1847. So looking um, in the distance there you can see uh, the beautiful meeting house and this beautiful stone in the foreground which has been reset from 1792 and uh, this beautiful angel so you'll see a shift in some of the gravestone designs from, you know, the, the skulls and bones to these angels, which happened in the late 18th century. And it was time that was called the Great Awakening. And it was this intense religious revival where death was no longer preached as a physical entity that would come to basically take you to the other side, that death was now a blessed reunion with those that had died and gone before you. So you see a shift in the gravestones as being um, much more kind and gentler. So you can really kind of chart that um, as you walk around the burial grounds. It's, um, it's pretty amazing to see the beliefs change right in front of you. So there is um, a fascinating story of a woman named uh, Goodwife Stover. Um, her name was Hannah Stover. She lived in Harpswell. Um, in the 1700s, and she was accused, very similar in our last story, of being a witch. And um, allegedly, she had been bewitching lots of things happening um, in town. Uh, animals weren't behaving properly. One mariner said that he essentially had been keel hauled by her, um, and she, you know, used her magic powers over him. Um, his name was Ezra Johnson. And Actually, she was just a midwife, and a lot of people in town didn't like the fact that she knew a lot about what was going on in private families because she was sitting with the wives while they were giving birth. So very sadly, um, when she passed away, uh, Ezra had gotten everybody so upset about her, he refused to carry her to the burial ground. You know, people went in procession together as a community to bury people. So he went to all of the men and insisted that they not carry her to the burial ground. The women on this cold November day got together, went and carried good wife Stover from the neck all the way here to the burial ground. And Ezra stood in the gateway and refused to let her be brought in. Um, he went on saying that he was bewitched and that only good people would be buried here. And he called her all sorts of foul names and really blockaded the burial ground so she could not be buried there. Um, the minister, knowing all she had done for the community, particularly um, the women, how she sat with them into the late watches of night while their husbands were out, you know, fishing and lobstering, made way and said, you know, essentially we're burying a saint here. What's very curious to me is there is no grave marker for this woman in here. There's a lot of Stovers, but I can't seem to find her gravestone that is here. Um, it's just, it's such an interesting time to consider how the communities were so involved with some of the burials that took place. And again, it just took one person to incite the entire community there to almost refuse her burial in the common burying ground. So this is over in um, Newcastle. This is the village cemetery. Um, Newcastle actually used to be part of Portsmouth um, up until about uh, close to 1700. And oftentimes um, when we do certain tours, we bring people through Newcastle. And I, I can't tell you how many people remark to me, they never even noticed this little tiny burial ground in the village kind of across from the post office, but essentially in someone's front yard. There's just a handful of gravestones that are there, but they're all um, pretty amazing. And you'll notice a lot of the names as place names here on the seacoast. So here we have um, this double gravestone from uh, the late 1700s with, of course, the death's head on a lunette. But if you look very closely underneath the mouth 
to the death's head, you can see a little tiny heart. Um, again, it was one of those things where you would not put symbols of affection on a colonial gravestone. However, um, this one managed to sneak it in. And of course, um, it's for two children. It's for a, a son and daughter, again, of the um, of the Prescotts. So it's it's subtle, but that sentiment is definitely there. Now, if you want to see a very interesting sentiment, just a couple of gravestones over, same burial ground in Newcastle. Here we have this amazing carving um, from 1742. And this is for Abigail Frost, daughter of the Honorable John Frost. And um, she was just 23, um, 23 years, eight months and four days when she passed January 30th, 1742. And you can see she literally was put on a pedestal. Whenever you see these beautiful um, cameo style portrait stones and they're elevated on that, you can see the love that the family had for this person. Um, these stones were incredibly expensive. You can see the eternal flame on um, the pillar on the right. She's about to be crowned. You can see the angel coming with the crown. So crowned in the glory of God, the anchor which sometimes represents a connection to the sea, but also anchored in, you know, in faith in God as well. But one of the things I wanted to point out is the fact that it says 23 years, eight months and four days. Why would you go to the trouble to spell all of that out? Well, interestingly enough, um, in colonial England, you were to treasure every moment of every day. So no matter how long, um, you know, you were alive for, sometimes they would put it on the gravestone just to remind you, you know, every day um, was a gift. And it's just amazing to me because some gravestone carvers charged by the letter. So where do some of the stones come from um, in Maine? So there was a huge quarry in uh, Munson, Maine. You can see just all of the hard work happening here. Um, in this historic photo of this quarry in Munson. Um, of course, this is a slate quarry. Um, I went up and visited it a couple of years ago to learn a little bit more about, you know, where gravestones come from. You can see it's completely flooded today, although there are still other parts of the quarry that are being used. Um, although not so much for gravestones as they once were, now they do um, the slate sinks. But quarries were, um, you know, really dangerous places to work. And, and considering where these stones have come from, again, they've really taken such a long journey to get there. So some of our stones have actually come from other parts of Maine. You heard me mention the um, funeral procession in Harpswell. So here is one in the 19th century. And the way things would work in our small communities is the church bell would be rung and there was a certain uh, number of chimes that would be rung when someone had passed on and you would go and attend to the family that had the death. We didn't, uh, you know, ship people off back in the day. We dealt with death at home. Um, we prepared the body at home. We had people come over and we would walk um, the deceased to the burial ground, sometimes via carriage, you know, sometimes um, they would be carried, much in the story that we were talking about in Harpswell. It's fascinating, though, when we dig a little deeper, um, no pun intended, into the funerary process here in New England, because it's very strange to think that the chief funerary expense in colonial New England wasn't the gravestone, it wasn't the coffin, it wasn't the carriage, it wasn't the minister. It was actually hard cider and rum. That was the most expensive thing for funerals back in the day. Um, in fact, Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote what grisly jolly it is for New Englanders whose only boon companion was uh, death itself when it came to drinking. So um, very interesting to think that uh, a lot of uh, people would hear the church bell and go and attend to the family because they wanted to help them. But also consider that, you know, there was some alcohol to be dispensed. And there's some documentation that some communities, some towns would actually pay for the alcohol to be dispensed. So I can't even imagine what that would have been like. I wanted to share with you this um, beautiful picture of a uh, gravestone cover shop here. This was over in Saco, and this was the sharp shop of Charles Cleves. Um, it was, he was pretty famous for being um, just such a prolific carver. 
of uh, marble monuments and headstones. And the shop stood on the east side of Main Street, um, opposite Pleasant Street. You can see Charles Cleves, um, an unknown sailor. I mean, just look at how fabulous he looks right there. Um, in the uniform of the time, um, a marble cutter, and this barefoot boy right there, um, William Moody, a harness maker and a teenager. So um, this is from about 1900. I mean, this was, this was a trade. Can you imagine the legacy of gravestones that are out there um, in main burial grounds that this man had carved? Um, sometimes you get lucky and you'll see a signature on a gravestone. So you're able to attribute um, it to who had carved the stone. Sometimes you'll even see initials, um, prices, and usually it's the style of carving that alerts us as to who the carver was. But this is just such a great picture. So this is a uh, another great photo um, from Maine. So here, um, this photo was taken on January 16th, 1922. The Corbillard was used for funerals and stored in a shed located on the corner of present day US 1 and Route 162 at the location of Jim's Convenience Store in Frenchville, Maine. Um, this beautiful glass coffin and look how it's, um, it's on a sled. Um, things like this that were uh, owned by um, towns or sometimes even owned by cemeteries, um, if it was a private cemetery, are absolutely amazing. Um, there's so few of them that exist anymore. And just to imagine what it would have been like to walk with this um, in the snow for the burial. And keep in mind that winter burials were, were much uh, uh, more scarce back in um particularly the 17 and 1800s, because the ground would be frozen and you couldn't always bury people. So they'd have to use underground tombs and take the people out in the spring at the first thaw. And I had a gentleman come on my um, tours a few years ago. He's from upstate New York. And I was talking about the underground tombs, how they're not used anymore. And he actually begged to differ with me quite a lot and told me that in New York, they still use them. And he knew some undertakers in Maine that use the underground tombs as well. So um, very interesting just to see this in, in the winter and just what a, a beautiful piece of history right there. So not too far uh, down the road um, in South Berwick is one of um, my favorite uh, beautiful 19th century grave markers with an angel. We see lots of angels um, in cemeteries and of course, um, peace and tranquility and the ability to be guided to the other side. But I really love this monument. Um, if you take a really close look at it, you'll notice that each book um, represents a family member here. And it's just so, so incredible to walk around and see again, this beautiful marble carving um, with a book for every every family member. So I want to um, give you this story as we start to wind down a little bit, um, because this is a story that constantly is underneath a lot of people's radar. Um, although once in a while, I'll talk to somebody that knows it quite well. It's um, a combination of a, a strange grave, roadside oddity, um, you know, a lot of ghost stories. And we're going to go over to um, the town of Hampton. I thought it'd be interesting, you know, for, for Halloween to, to talk about, you know, some of the, the witches' graves or people that were perceived to be witches. And um, this is the story of uh, Goody Cole. Uh, she was from Hampton, New Hampshire. She lived uh, along the river in Hampton and was said to be very disagreeable. Um, if something had gone wrong in the community, it was typically blamed on Goody Cole, you know, if animals were acting up or if boats were overturning in the river. Um, apparently it had something to do with Goody Cole's ill will. Um, she, she was said to be kind of bristly and kind of kept to herself. And it just so happens that she was accused by the locals of witchcraft. And she was brought down to Boston and accused and almost, you know, put through an entire trial. But um, the case was let go and she was acquitted. And when she went back to Hampton, once again, as strange things unfolded in the community, she found herself being blamed. And she was sent to Boston once again and tried and this time convicted of witchcraft. And she was imprisoned. The year was 1656. So we are pre-Salem witchcraft trial, so pre-1692 of the hysteria. 
And um, it was one of those cases where I think the folks in Hampton had believed that they were done with Goody Cole, that she had been tried and convicted, Im imprisoned, and they never had to deal with her again. Well, strangely enough, uh, they didn't get off so easily because Boston needed to feed Goody Cole and provide for this woman in jail, and they weren't going to foot the bill. They insisted that the folks in Hampton pay the bill. And they sent bills to Hampton and Hampton did not respond. They sent a warning to Hampton and said, we're going to ship her back unless you decide to pay for her. And apparently Hampton did not get that message or they chose to ignore it because one day there was Goody Cole brought to Hampton from Boston and dropped on the doorstep now for them to handle. Well, they decided they still didn't want to have Goody Cole in the town, so they brought her over to Amesbury. And Amesbury ran into the same problem that Boston had, that they needed somebody to pay for her, you know, essentially upkeep. And unfortunately, Hampton refused to pay for that, so she was shipped back to Hampton. And the folks in Hampton had to take care of her, essentially, until she died. She lived in a shack where Hampton Town Common is today. And the day that she died, they walked in, she was, you know, crumpled over on a pile of hay and they made the decision um, to bury her very quickly. Again, they, you know, consider that she was a witch. And at some point, someone got the notion to actually dig her back up. And when they dug her back up, it was with the intent of putting a stake through her heart. The belief was that she was in such a league with the devil that they needed to do something to make sure that the devil did not come to Hampton. So um, on the left, you can see this newspaper article. Um, this was actually uh, in the Chicago newspaper back in the 1950s. Of course, the story goes back uh, much, much further than that. And it just gives you a, a very uh, interesting illustration of you know, what this depiction looked like. So they dug her up, put the stake through her body, and essentially reburied her on the town common. So somewhere in the 1930s, the folks in Hampton decided that, you know, we probably made a mistake. And in 1938, the decision was made to clear Goody Cole of all the charges. So, um, Prints were made of the original conviction papers, and they were brought down along with this tin to Hampton Beach. In fact, none other than Harry Houdini's wife had come in for the ceremony, where they were going to, again, burn the papers in clear goody coal of any ill will. Well, strangely enough, this was quite the event because they were actually selling all sorts of Goody Cole memorabilia at this event, such as this Goody Cole doll, which, you know, you could purchase of, uh, you know, to commemorate the event, um, these Goody Cole airmail stamps, um, all of these strange items that related to this story were available for people to purchase, which to me just, um, you know, I, I have such a hard time trying to imagine what that would have been like you know here goody call we're really sorry we're going to you know burn these conviction papers and while you're here buy this goody call doll buy this goody call stamp so of course the ceremony happened and you might have thought that would have been the end of the story of goody call however as we moved into the 1950s there were stories of people seeing her ghost on Hampton Town Common. And the stories were coming from pretty reputable sources, including the police department. They were saying that they could see a woman um, bent over with a walking stick with a long cape wandering around um, Hampton Town Common. And sometimes they drive by and in a split second, the woman who was on the side of the road had disappeared. There was a woman who also lived along the common and she said it was a hot summer day. She invited this mysterious woman into her sun parlor for some lemonade. She sat her down, went to the kitchen to get her a drink, came back a moment later, and the woman was gone, and yet she never heard the door open and close. So with all of these ghost stories, um, a local school teacher decided to mark Goody Cole's grave, and this was the stone that was chosen. How absolutely strange is this stone? 
So this stone was placed over the grave in hopes that, you know, it would take care of, um, you know, paying homage to Goody Cole and doing the right thing. Well, unfortunately, that didn't keep the ghost story at bay. So this stone was there. However, some years ago, not too long ago, during um, Hampton's 375th anniversary, which I went and attended, um, I was very surprised and very glad to see this turn of events because here we have a proper gravestone, which strangely enough, um, a friend of mine had done some fundraising through sales of a, um, a musical CD and raised enough money for this plaque to be put over her grave. And New Hampshire sent down a representative from the uh, State House in Concord to read another proclamation and to also during that speech mentioned that she hoped that the spirit of Goody Cole would finally rest in peace and that she wouldn't bother the good folks of Hampton Town. But here's a strange footnote for you. So we don't know exactly if this is the spot where Goody Cole is buried. It could be a little bit further over, um, further back. This is just guessed as to where it is. But the Tuck Museum that's on site has a lot of information. And again, um, the artifacts that I just shared with you are photos that I took of them when I was researching the story. But um, it's strange how a lot of people will, you know, come to events again or um, come on tours and ask about, you know, witchcraft in New England. And they essentially just went through Hampton and didn't even know that there was a story of, you know, poor Goody Cole. And then you've got the story over in York as well. It's just um, also so very, very interesting. So, um, wow, I really tried to uh, race through that because we got a little bit of a late start. So um, you can find me on um, Instagram at RoxyZW. You can find me on Facebook as well at Million Curiosities. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, push a button and hopefully come back on the screen. This has been um, very exciting, very exciting evening. And um, I appreciate your patience. I still um, have no idea how all of that happened earlier. But um, let me see if I can come back on the screen for you here, perhaps, maybe, here I come. Um, hopefully, hopefully you can see me. Um, I'm gonna take a look and see, I thought I saw a couple of questions come up in the chat. Um, question for later. Why do they not include the birth dates of people, but just their exact age in years and months? Um, hopefully I was able to answer some of that question for you. So it was more about, you know, the, the life that you lived, how long you had versus putting the years on the gravestones themselves, giving people an idea of, you know, this is how long you have left in in you know years, months, and days, it's it was a very interesting way of looking at you know cherishing every moment that you had. Um, I was in a cemetery in Warren, Maine yesterday, and on a grave that man had died at Bull Run, um, and that cemetery also has original settlers. Oh, that's amazing! There's um some really fascinating um, graves as you get up in Maine. There's the um, the stranger's grave that's in gray. Um, and it was a uh, com Confederate soldier whose uh, body sort of got lost along the way. And he ended up um, being buried in uh, Gray, Maine. And his, his grave has the Confederate flag on it. There's just some very, very interesting, um, very interesting stories in Maine. So thanks for sharing that, Beth. What is your scariest personal ghost story? Oh, my gosh. Um, wow. Uh, let's see. I mean, certainly the story of Elizabeth really did um, surprise me quite a lot, for sure. Um, never really expected that to uh, to happen, just walking around on a beautiful day. Um, I, you know, I have had things happen from, um, from time to time. Um, I guess I would probably have to say, most likely, um, you know, Portion Harbor Lighthouse. Uh, it is... Um, just a beautiful place over on the island of Newcastle. And uh, I had met the uh, original lighthouse keeper's wife over there. Um, Connie Small, when she was 100 years old, she passed at 103. And 
um, one night while we were there um, doing an investigation, she actually um, made herself known while we were up in the keeper's house and it was somewhere around, you know, two 30 in the morning. And there were such details and such an energy and such a presence that it was very overwhelming um, because she had just passed away four months previous. And it's still actually, um, I don't want to say scares me um, because Connie was an absolutely amazing woman and I, I treasure knowing her. It still, um, it still kind of rings very deeply for me, even when I'm over in Newcastle and I'm standing there thinking about Connie, I sometimes feel like she's, she's there with me and I find myself looking over my shoulder. And that was one of those nights where I knew for sure that there were spirits that were on the other side. Again, you have those few experiences and you're like, Oh my God, there's definitely something going on. Um, let me see. Have you been, Oh gosh, yes. Chester village cemetery is amazing. Um, I, I, I didn't want to focus too much on New Hampshire, um, but I love Chester Village Cemetery. I've um, done a lot of presentations for the folks in um, in Chester over the years, and I'm so glad that I did. Otherwise, I never would have discovered their amazing cemetery. One of the things that you want to check out, um, Vonnie, if you're over there, is the Abel gravestones. You have two brothers that carved gravestones. One carved the gravestones with a happy face, and the other one carved them with a sad face. And the belief was that one believed that death was a release from your troubles and the other one believed that death was very sad. So the two brothers carved their two varying opinions on the gravestones and you'll actually find some of the gravestones are signed by the Websters in that cemetery. There was a great piece that was done on that um, I think it was like 1972 or 1973 um, in the New Hampshire Historical Society about their carvings in Chester. Oh, it's absolutely amazing. Um, just so, so good. So does anybody else have um, any questions before we go for the uh, evening? You had some really good questions there in the chat. So thank you so much. Oh, you're very, very welcome. Will, will I be doing this again? Uh, well, you'll have to ask the folks at the Berwick Public Library. Um, I have lots and lots and lots of cemetery stories. Um, of course, you can see some of the um, virtual tours that I do of cemeteries on my website as well. Um, but I would love to, uh, to be back um, and do another presentation for Berwick. There's just, there's so much, so much stuff. Um, there are also two metal tombstones. I live in Chester and do headstone research find a grave. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, let me see. Thank you so much. Are you familiar with the dash? Um, I worked in a funeral home for many years. There was short verse read at many funerals. It's one of a tribute. Oh, I am not familiar, Lisa, with um, the dash. I'll have to message that one to me. That's something I'd be very, very interested in seeing. Um, thank you so much, Kelly, for your, um, for your comments. I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. I know we got off to a, a weird start, but I'm glad we got everything, um, all figured out. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll see, maybe we'll, um, we'll do something again with, um, with Berwick. We would love to have you back. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to a time we can all meet at the library and turn the lights down and, and do this again and have all these questions. So thank you so much, Roxy. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And Have thanks everyone. Week. Yeah. And thanks everyone for coming and check out Roxy's website. It's very cool. Always Stay something spooky. going on. <laughs> Stay spooky. Stay right. spooky. Have a great Halloween, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.